Hello, everybody. For several years, it's been my good fortune to tell the radio audience about General Electric and its House of Magic. Of all developments, none holds more romance and better typifies industrial progress than does the story of the Mazda lamp, the development of which ushered in that great age of electricity in which we live. Won't you join me while I turn back the pages to 1879? And after that, well, I'll show you why we are living in the age of life. Coach days. Yes, and coach dogs too. Such was the romantic setting in which the lamp industry was born. More than 50 years ago, Menlo Park, New Jersey was being heralded as the scientific center of the world. Today, Menlo Park has been recreated at Greenfield, Dearborn, Michigan, by Thomas A. Edison's beloved friend, Henry Ford. Its keeper today is Francis Yale, who on that memorable day of October 21st, 1879, assisted Edison on the occasion of the burning of the first practical incandescent lamp. Of course, Mr. Yale will be glad to show us what lamp making was like way back in 1879. First of all, let's go back to the little old glass house where bulbs were blown. This was used originally as a photographic studio until Edison began his intensive research on incandescent lighting. This artisan needed full cheeks and strong lungs to do his work well. Alternating between the blue flame and the glass blower's parched lips, the glass tubing begins slowly to take form. It took feet as well as hands and mouth to complete a bulb in those days. The gas for the glass house was made in that carpenter shop. This lad is mixing air and gasoline to form first a vapor and then gas. There will be a good supply when the reservoir back of the mixing chamber is filled. When a bulb is finished, it is sent to the lamp experts in the laboratory. We are going now to the famous laboratory where the world's first practical lamp was made in October 1879. The workshop was on the second floor. Here, Mr. Edison also made important discoveries relating to the modern telephone and phonograph. Here, too, he produced the strange phenomena known as the Edison effect which proved to be the fundamental basis of the present radio tube. The laboratory has been restored to its original condition. This historical chest of drawers from the original Menlo Park was the spot where Mr. Edison experimented with filament wires. During his lamp researches, he examined 5,000 different kinds of grasses, roots, herbs, fibers, procured from all parts of the world. And when he found a likely looking material, he treated it with a carbon putty made from coke pounded into dust. The filaments of the early practical lamps were cotton thread. And now here is the birthplace of the first lamp. On the occasion of the golden jubilee of Edison's lamp, Menlo Park at Dearborn was dedicated with a great celebration in honor of the Wizard of Menlo Park. Before President Hoover and Mr. Ford, Edison reenacted the epical event of 50 years ago. These are replicas of the mercury pumps used in 1879 to exhaust the air from the bulb. It took five hours or more to get a good vacuum in those days. But today, 30,000 lamps can be exhausted in the same period of time. The mercury flows from a reservoir, a bottle, above, through a rubber hose to the glass tube of the pump, one end of which is connected to the lamp. As the mercury passes through, it traps bubbles of air in the lamp and forces them down and out of the tube and into a lower reservoir of mercury. A good vacuum was known to have been obtained when air bubbles no longer appeared in the mercury chamber. The early pumps also contained chambers of chemicals and gold leaf, which helped to absorb the moisture and mercury vapor present in the pump and lamp. When the lamp has been completely exhausted, the mercury in the lower reservoir is returned again to the upper reservoir to be used as other lamps are evacuated. When Mr. Edison was satisfied with the vacuum, the lamp was given a temporary seal, the finished seal being made in the little glass house. This is an earlier mechanical air pump. It was while working with this pump that Mr. Edison discovered that metals liberate gases. 
Having made a lamp, Edison was naturally anxious to know how much energy it consumed. This calorimeter was devised for that purpose. In the early days, candles were used as the standard of light. The lamp to be tested was placed at one end and two standard English candles at the other. The screen there in the center was moved up and down until the grease spot disappeared, which showed that the light of the candles and of the lamp were equal at that point. Mr. Edison and his associates experimented with a great many different types of filament material. Here are only a few of the early lamps with their filaments of platinum, carbonized paper, and bamboo. Odd looking, aren't they? in contrast with our Mazda lamps of today. And then, twilight, and a few more lamps finished. It took a good many days to complete the 60 lamps required to make the famous demonstration to the public at Menlo Park in December 1879. But Mr. Yale has promised to go with us to Cleveland, where Neela Park, the lighting center of the world, is located. We want to show him how lamps are made today and what exacting precautions are taken to build them constantly better in quality and lower in price. First, he wants to say goodbye to the folks at the old Jordan boarding house. Yes, the horse and buggy have passed, but how much faster and more convenient is this new mode of travel? Mr. Yale's heart enters the gondola of the ship that is to take him through the sky to Neela Park. And now we're off, up she goes, and in just a few hours, Mr. Yale will be at his destination. In 1879, this would have been a long, long, dusty, tiresome ride. Neela Park was created in 1913 by Franklin S. Terry and Burton G. Tremaine. These two pioneers had faith in the great future of the lamp industry. And now we're over Cleveland, Mr. Yale. There's Cleveland's magnificent Union Terminal, which is located in the very heart of a metropolis which the electrical industry has helped to create. Suppose we swing closer to this great tower, which is a piece of fine architectural construction. And below, you can see all forms of modern transportation, much of which is electrified. And just eight miles to the east is Neela Park. This is Neela Park. It's 16 buildings spotted conveniently on 90 acres of beautiful countryside. We are directly over the service building, and the statues you see depict the victory of light over darkness. And what a symbol for a great industry. No wonder that this has been termed the University of Light and has earned the distinction of being the best kept plant in America. Here centers the activities that keep Mazda lamps made by General Electric always a step ahead in quality, service, and dependability. In the laboratories are scientists and engineers who are ever seeking to develop better lighting for the home, the store, the factory, and yes, the airplane and the airship. Neela Park, with its laboratories and scientists, has given to the world the inside frosted lamp, the daylight lamp, the sun lamp, the flame tint lamp, the tipless lamp, better lamps for your automobile, and made practical that great new aid to photography the Mazda photo flash lamp. Now you're over the engineering building where engineers are engaged in the practical application of lighting. Here too are located the sales and promotion experts who direct the sales and sales promotion of more than 300 million Mazda lamps a year. Below us is the famous quadrangle and Mr. Yale, doesn't that make you think of a great American University. Here is a better view of the sales promotion building where the General Electric Lighting Institute is located. And now let's nose down, whoop, there we go, and soon we can start on our visit to the modern laboratories and factories of General Electric. There's a treat in store and Mr. Yale is anxious to be brought up to date on that great business which he helped to start more than 50 years ago. And now we're on the ground and wasn't that a great ride? Well, well, and a pleasant one, too. Well, I had a nice time. How about you, Mr. Yale? Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Pilot. Now, just a few greetings before we get on our journey. Of course, there's Mr. Enfield, who's always glad to see an old lamp man, and Mr. Roberts, too. Well, boys, let's go to the administration building and rest for just a few minutes before we start on that most interesting of journeys through the world's greatest lamp factory.
one of our own tank cars filled with sand. It is shipped this way so that the sand will be free from impurities and moisture. Glass making is one of the oldest arts. Good glass requires raw materials that are free from iron content. Here are some of them. Soda ash from Ohio. Nitrate of soda from Chile and Virginia. Feldspar from North Carolina. Lime from Ohio. Collet or broken glass and sand crushed from Illinois and Pennsylvania rock. Then these materials are weighed and mixed ready for the tanks which told 250 tons of molten glass. Taking a peek into a tank of glass where the temperature is 1300 degrees centigrade. Wow, we'll say it's hot. A tank of molten glass feeds three marvelous machines, each geared to make as many as 175,000 bulbs every 24 hours. This machine, developed by General Electric, is almost human, as you will see presently. There they go, four of them, timed perfectly to pass on their charge to an equal number of hungry, empty cups. Every catch is of the same size and weight, just enough to make a perfect bulb. Reach, drop, reach, drop, never tiring, never stopping. They are on their way spinning and turning several revolutions before they begin to drop and fall. Now as the air begins to force its way into the glass, you see it getting longer and longer. It is taking form and these molds that are sneaking up will finish it. Actually, the bulbs are not formed against the mold, but against a cushion of steam which is forced in around the mold. Now the mold will open its jaw so that you can see it has done its work. Simple, isn't it? And yet, truly wonderful. The spindles then cast aside their prey and hustle on for another catch. Well, after a hot trip like that, you'd like to cool off too. But these bulbs are not through yet. Their necks are too long and we will have to prune them. Now they're getting it. When these knives of fire get finished with their work, the bulbs will be of just the right length for the particular size of lamp they're going to make. The finished bulbs are thrown onto a second conveyor run through an annealer and allowed to cool gradually. Here the final inspections begin. Every bulb is scrutinized for such glass defects as blisters, bubbles, and strains. This girl with finely trained eyes can detect the bad ones in a jiffy. The bulbs placed on the revolving tray are good ones and are packed in cartons ready for delivery to the inside frosting department. Lamps are taken at random from shipping containers and given special tests for bulb roundness, wall thickness, then head thickness. Of course, weight, bead thickness, and lastly, overall length. Even in the early days of the lamp business, efforts were made to frost lamps on the inside. 
Inside frosting, you know, cuts down the glare without reducing the amount of light. The task at first seemed hopeless until Anila Park chemist tackled the problem just a few years ago. Now see it being done as tray after tray is fed into this electrically operated machine. The first etching makes the bulb extremely fragile, as you will see presently. This was the stumbling block of scientists for countless years. A spray of chemicals and the first etch is completed. As the tray moves along, it gets a rinse. This is step two in inside frosting. The bulbs are given a second and a final etching. It is this spray which restores them to their original strength. The development of this hardening etch is the contribution of Mazda service and General Electric. With a final rinse, the process is completed. This young lady will show you why the second etching is very important. When the ball strikes, well, see for your crash. <laughs> this got only the first spray. And now, let's try a lamp that received its complete treatment. Will it break? No. Well, another test. Let's try it again. And there's your answer. Here you see the bulbs on their way to get a final inspection. One operator checks the globular end, the other the neck. When the trays pass this point, the lamps are packed in containers for shipment to the various General Electric lamp factories. Flanges together with leading in wires and exhaust tubing make that part of the lamp known as the mount. In just a little while, we will show you how mounts are assembled. As the moving arm spins and revolves, intense fires play on the bottom of the tubing, softening it. When the heated glass is of just the right consistency, this little spinning gadget comes up and makes a beveled edge or flare. Let slow motion show you how easy this is to do. When the flare is made, the arm releases the tubing, which drops to just the right length for a particular size of lamp. Then the flange is cut to size 21 flares a minute. 